uh, before I get started today, I actually have a little something that I want to um, to share with you guys. And it's a, um, there's a, uh, there's a poem on children um, in uh, Cahill Gibran's The Prophet. And it goes, your children are not your children. They're the sons and daughters of life longing for itself. They come through you, but they are not from you. And though they are with you, they belong not to you. You can give them your love, but not your thoughts. They have their own thoughts. You can house their bodies, but not their souls, for the souls are in a place of tomorrow that you cannot visit, not even in your dreams. You can strive to be like them, but you cannot make them just like you. Um, and I wanted to share that uh, because I think um, here in just a moment, you're going to see just how relevant that is, but I'm especially mindful of that. Uh, poem uh, today and this week because it is actually Aurora's birthday uh, this week on the 28th. So really excited to be celebrating that. Um, and so our families are going to be in town. It's a really interesting time uh, of the year and it's a really interesting time uh, as I shared in my joys and concerns and kind of in our lives right now. Uh, so I'll talk about that as well. So the topic for today is inflection. And I generally love to, um, when, I, when I'm at my best, I think I generally like to start kind of unpacking uh, some things definitionally. Uh, and I kind of do that, um, two of my favorite speakers um, ever in history, and certainly in American history, uh, are Abraham Lincoln and MLK. And they both kind of started their talks. It took them a little bit to... Uh, to get up to speed, but once they got going, it really took off. And I, I certainly can't say that I'm anywhere near on par of those two incredible speakers. Um, but it's something that's always made a lot of sense to me, because I really like getting into um, the meanings of our words and what we mean when we say our words. So I want to kind of go through a few things on uh, inflection. Um, the first uh, definition uh, of inflection um, one of the ones that kind of comes to mind for me, uh, being someone who so thoroughly enjoyed uh, math in school, is is inflection point. Uh, and there's a really there's like there's some really cool uh, mathematical things that arise that bring about an inflection point on the graph. Uh, but in kind of parlum, common parlance, one of my, my calculus teacher used to say, it's when something really interesting happens. <laughs> On the graph, you know, it's when you're you're following the graph, you're following the, the plot points. Maybe you're looking at your x y table, and um, it's it's when the numbers go all wonky. He would he he was such a neat guy. He always had kind of a kind of a common parlance way of putting things, and then he would unpack the technical. Um, the second is inflection in uh, your voice. Um, so inflection of a sound or a note, right? And I, I spent a little bit of time thinking about that one because <coughs> I, um, I've noticed I haven't had, um, I used to speak quite frequently. I was a uh, speaker and a debater in, in uh, both high school and in college. So it's something I did really frequently and it's something that I really enjoyed. Um, the last time I spoke was when I spoke here. And the time before that that I spoke, I don't know what. So I'm, I'm pretty, pretty dusty, pretty rusty, right? Um, and I was thinking about the inflection in my voice. Um, and I've been thinking about this point on inflection in voices and all that as we're approaching 2020 and we're seeing uh, candidates hit the campaign cycle. It's really interesting to watch the uh, conviction um, and uh, so on. and, and uh, in various candidates' speeches, uh, the way they deliver their message, the style of their message, and the substance of their message. That juxtaposition is something that I'm going to be tracking all throughout the race because there are a number of folks who are delivering messages with incredible conviction, um, and there are, there, are, there are some folks that I'm wondering if maybe they're being a bit abstract. 
And so there are some folks that I think are super strong on policy, really strong on policy. I think they've got a very clear vision for the kinds of things that uh, are reasons why you should vote for them. And then there are some folks that have kind of a, uh, I'm noticing at least there seems to be a trend of a lot of abstraction. And so I'm kind of wondering um, about that, about that uh, uh, with inflection. And then the third thing, and really the most important thing, um, and this is a more generalizing thing that even encompasses the previous two, is that inflection means change. Um, when, there's a, when there's an inflection point in the graph, or when there's an inflection in your voice, it's connoting a change. And the reason that I kind of, the reason that I came up with that idea of calling this talk simply inflection is that I've been caught up in all of this societal change that's been taking place um, over the course of my life, uh, over the course of the past few years, um, the change going on in my, in my own life, um, and then also those changes that I was talking about, and for those of you who are here at my last talk, I've been wrestling a lot with those changes too. Um, in my own faith journey, uh, for those of you who weren't here, my own faith journey, in my journey to UU, finding UU, uh, and becoming stronger in, in what I think Unitarian Universalism has to offer. So, um, I'm, I'm ultimately, I ultimately wanted to say that uh, I'm here to talk about change in that, in that sense change inflection in that sense. Um, and then I think that, that that math piece and the voice piece have something to say uh, to us about uh, change in the sense of the questions. How do we deal with it? How do we cope? And how do we deal with the throes of upheaval? Um, and I'll unpack exactly what that means uh, across a few um, uh, points. I want to look at the world, uh, the writ large. I want to look at the United States. I want to look at Tennessee. Uh, and I may even do that in the reverse of, uh, order of that. I want to share kind of where I am and where I think we are. So the first thing to do, I think, is to talk about our present situation. Um, in, in the United States, I'll start there. Uh, in the United States, there's, we're, we're dealing with what I think can only be described as an unmooring of our institutions. And I don't think that it's by accident, and I don't think that it's, um, you know, anything that's uh, uh, frivolous or um, unintentional. Um, if you examine the... Uh, the formulation of the the cabinet of the presidency, you see uh, a number of high-level lobbyists um, who are now holding senior cabinet-level positions, um, and that says something. That says something about where we, where we are. Um, it says something about where we are, especially in light of um, kind of a populist revolt that supposedly had taken place where there was a promise sold to um, a, a, a special particular kind of portion of our society um, that was told that we were going to drain the swamp and we were going to change things in Washington and it wasn't going to be sort of the business as usual, K Street to uh, the Capitol, um, pay for play kind of schemes. And then we have the embodiment of um, a very explicit uh, endorsement and uh, about the most direct violation of that um, that we've ever seen. Um, it was really interesting to me. So Nancy McLean uh, came to MTSU and I went to see her talk. Uh, she wrote a book called Democracy and Change in Chains. And she unpacks um, what I mean when I say that this wasn't in any way unintentional. And that there are a number of causes, a lot of folks would like to ascribe these things to one person. Um, 
And there are a number of causes that have everything to do with generations, decades, of transitions, inflections that arose, took place, came about before one person that a lot of folks like to ascribe this to uh, going about in, in our society. Um, and it was really interesting to me. She shared a quote uh, from Clarence Thomas, Justice Clarence Thomas, speaking to a conservative think tank uh, called uh, the Heritage Foundation. He's speaking to a conservative think tank, and he says, at some point we have to recognize that we are unmooring our institutions. At some point we have to face the fact that we've, we've gone so far that we're undoing our own institutions. And so to have a Supreme Court justice say this uh, in public uh, with press access to, um, if you will, kind of his own, um, I think is, is something that could demonstrate most clearly, succinctly, concisely to you um, the nature of the problem um, without kind of walking through uh, Nancy's whole whole sort of uh, talk. When I saw that, when, I, when she said that, that jarred me that Clarence Thomas himself even acknowledged this so openly. Um, and, so, and so what's the sort of thing I mean? Um, in, in our state alone, that means uh, uh, our Secretary of State pushing uh, voter ID laws, and then our Secretary of State uh, for several years um, and it, and it means our Secretary of State uh, of Tennessee uh, issuing a letter uh, urging our congressional delegation not to vote for House Resolution 1. Um, House Resolution 1 at the federal level uh, in our U.S. Congress does so many things it would be almost impossible to describe uh, to make uh, moves in the right direction for ostensibly, arguably, there are a few problems that I have with the bill, but a lot of great things going on with it that include um, access to the ballot, uh, expanding access to the ballot, restoring the Voting Rights Act, um, making it so that um, we don't have uh, partisan uh, drawing of districts, uh, a number of electoral reforms uh, that folks have been pushing for for decades are encapsulated in this bill, and he spoke, he spoke against the bill in, in the same kind of flippant way that we saw uh, Mitch McConnell speak against the bill, where he just kind of used these broad uh, labeling, uh, accus accusatory terms, um, and I, I challenged him, I ch challenged him, and I said to him, Mr. Secretary, do you mean, he said, uh, what he, what he claimed was that uh, this was an instrument that was being used in a partisan fashion to advance the uh, cause of one party alone. And I said, Mr. Secretary, you can't possibly be uh, intellectually honest and intellectually serious and say that. Um, to use your position, which has nothing to do with our congressional delegation, uh, rather than to carry out your constitutional duties, to use your platform, to issue a letter, to say something like this. You can't possibly be serious when you have done a number of things to restrict access to the ballot, um, to, um, to push for and lobby the uh, Tennessee State Legislature to ensure that um, if you haven't voted in, I think it's like the previous two elections, that you have to renew your voting registration. Uh, to ensure that we have a photo ID law, which we have a number of Republican uh, congressmen and women um, on the state and federal level openly saying that this is a strategy to benefit their party. We know that there's no question. Uh, the Supreme Court even had a decision uh, regarding this that was um, uh, around this issue saying that, um, I believe it was North Carolina, they talked about how the uh, packing of districts was with incredible precision. Uh, the language is incredibly troubling. <laughs> so those are, those are just a few things. I mean, um, to touch back on where, where I am when I was talking about my, my, my job loss, uh, 
when I think about where I've been over the past handful of years or so, kind of from where I left off in my talk last time, right, um, there's been a number of surprise diagnoses uh, in my family. Um, it's been a, there's been a story of uh, suicides, people close to me. Um, there's um, uh, a number of my friends that I know that have received surprise diagnoses that they can't afford their medical bills for. Um, there are a number of friends that I, that I have um, who have, in some cases, uh, received diagnoses that are terminal illnesses uh, that came out of nowhere. Uh, in some cases, there are medicines that might treat them, cure them, prolong their life, and they don't even have access to those. Um, and I've been wrestling for uh, a long time, for all of those years since, again, where I left off in that jumping point on that last talk. I've been wrestling with, I mean, how the hell do we cope with that? What is, what is it, how is it we, we deal with that fact? And I spent um, too much of my time, when I was a teenager especially, um, kind of thinking so much about myself in a solipsistic way. Oh, poor me, and oh, poor the people that are, you know, uh, I'm most closely associated with, right? That this is somehow isolated off to me, which I knew, obviously, intellectually, to be incredibly false. I mean, when I was three years old, I used to cry about the state of global poverty, right? So I'm not so solipsistic, but sometimes you get kind of caught up in that. And I, um, when I was making some notes on this talk and I was thinking, I mean, how the heck do I have anything uh, to even offer uh, coming up on March 23rd? How do I have anything at all to say to the folks at Toll Hold? Because I can't even, I can, you know, I'm coming to them and I just lost my job. Uh, you know, so I didn't even, I didn't even hang on to that. Um, so I was like, you know, I don't even in some ways have any kind of credibility, right? That's sort of some of the thoughts that were going on. And I was getting really down on myself. And I was listening to um, one of those candidates, because I do that, because I'm a political junkie. And this, this candidate in particular described the experience of their upbringing and talked about how they came up, talked about how they came up working class, talked about how they you know, eventually made it, right? And um, they said that they always thought that the lesson of their mother um, who uh, she grew up, the mother grew up uh, in the early 1900s. Um, gets out, goes through the Great Depression, um, loses um, her, her, they lose her father, and after, uh, after they lose her father, they say, what are we gonna do? And she says that um, she, she walks in and her mother's uh, been pacing um, in, their, in her mother and father's bedroom. And she said that uh, she sees the dress. And she said, if anyone from that generation knows what I mean with the dress, they know it's the dress that only comes out for special events, weddings, uh, funerals maybe, uh, birthdays, that's it. And so it's laid out, draped across the bed. And her mother's fretting, and she says, so she goes and gets a job working at Sears, making a minimum wage, and is able to take care of her family. And she said, I thought about this transition that I saw, my mother coping with that, if you will, inflection. Um, and she said, I thought about how we were able to make it and how, then I started thinking about wages being stagnant, and she started thinking about all these broader economic issues, and she said, I came to realize a few things. Number one was that uh, she said I thought coming up that that was just that was just me, uh, and she said I quickly realized how ignorant that was of me to have thought that, and that really struck me because it, it shook me out of the cobwebs, and it's going to really unpack the, the ultimate, ultimately the sort of the meat of the talk for today. And the second thing was she said that uh, I realized that all of these much larger uh, causes going on concurrently, simultaneously, uh, for that, uh, for it to be the case that so many Americans had that same kind of experience of working hard and not being able to make it. 
um, so many fr so many uh, folks have the same kind of story about losing a job, uh, even if they like me even received a letter that said that they lost their job through no fault of their own, uh, that they're in good standing, eligible for rehire, and all this lovely stuff that doesn't do a whole lot to help you out when you've got a family counting on you. And there's a lot of shame that you experience with that. And the reason that you feel that shame is because we have a society that operates um, on scarcity. And so to quote from a book that I had cited um, in the last talk as well, I'm going to pull from Brene Brown for a moment, uh, Daring Greatly. And in it, she, uh, before she kind of unpacks uh, a number of points that she makes, she talks about what they're all rooted in, and she talks about this basic frame of scarcity. So she says, scarcity doesn't take hold in a coach culture overnight, but the feeling of scarcity does thrive in shame-prone cultures that are deeply steeped in comparison and fractured by disengagement. And then she says, by shame-prone culture, she doesn't mean that we're ashamed of our collective identity, but there, that there are enough of us struggling with the issue of worthiness that's shaping our culture. There are enough of us uh, struggling with the issue of worthiness that it is shaping our culture, rather. She goes on to say, worrying about scarcity is our culture's version of post-traumatic stress. So it's like she's talking about a culture-wide phenomenon. It happens when we've been through too much, and rather than coming together to heal, which requires vulnerability, we're angry and scared at each other's threats. We're angry and scared and at each other's threats. I'm so sorry. It's not the large, just the larger culture that's suffering. I found the same dynamics playing out in family culture, work culture, school culture, culture, and community culture. And they all share the same formula of shame, comparison, and disengagement. Scarcity bubbles up from this, these conditions and perpetuates them until a critical mass of people start making different choices and reshaping the smaller cultures they belong to. And so that's ultimately something that, um, that I think that we can take and apply here in the U.S. It's something I think we can apply in our state and it's something I think that we can apply in Unitarian Universalism. When I gave my last talk there was someone who asked me uh, they said, Matthew, uh, with all of the things that you shared with us today, what do you think the direction of Unitarian Universalism is? And I set out to give you guys a talk before all these terrible things happen and transpire. And there's even more to the story that I'm uh, not even going to get into uh, today. A number of things that really surprised us and were difficult to deal with. Um, I had set out to answer that question. And I had done so with the hope, ironically, that um, I was going to deliver a talk called An Active Hope. And so that's going to be, in a moment, part of my, I guess, suggestion or recommendation or prescription. It's so hard for a UU to uh, really tell you what to do, right? And I don't want to tell anyone what to do, but what I, what I want to observe and toss back your way and maybe talk about second hour how we can do this. Um, is um, is in part, I was going to borrow from Dr. King, uh, Where Do We Go From Here? And I cited this book too. And so I've got to share another quote. Um, and that is, if we're going to, if we're going to operate in a, in, a, in a tenor that isn't in scarcity, then we're going to have to operate in power. And uh, I want to unpack his definition of power. And he said, power properly understood is the ability to achieve, to achieve purpose. It is the strength required to bring about social, political, or economic changes. In this sense, power is not only desirable, but necessary in order to implement the demands of love and justice. One of the greatest problems of history is that the concepts of love and power are usually contrasted as polar opposites. Love is identified with a resignation of power, and power with a denial of love. Um, to break off from that for a moment, one of my favorite quotes used to be Jimi Hendrix, um, when the power of love overcomes the love of power, the world will know peace. King kind of does some interesting things with a conception very similar to that here. It was this misinterpretation that caused Nietzsche, the philosopher of the will to power, to reject the Christian concept of love. Of course, remember where King's speaking from, right? 
It was this same misinterpretation that induced Christian theologians to reject Nietzsche's philosophy of the will to power in the name of the Christian idea of love. And then he goes on to say, and this is the center right here, what is needed is a realization that power without love is reckless and abusive, and that love without power is sentimental and anemic. I have to say that again. What is needed is a realization that power without love is reckless and abusive, and that love without power is sentimental and anemic. Power at its best is love implementing the demands of justice, where justice at its best is love correcting everything that stands against love. Um, when I thought about hope and I thought about talking about an active hope, um, I had a particular conception in mind. Um, I wanted to give a whole talk where I, I talked about all the ways that people have overcome in spite of you know these momentous odds and, and, and everything like that. And I, and I wanted to give something that ultimately, frankly, in a lot of ways, uh, I had problems with as I was writing. I was like, this is just a bunch of rhetoric. This is just a bunch of uh, pathos sort of rhetoric. It's not, it's not authentic because it's not grounded in experience. It's not me speaking from my experience. It's just me kind of doing the same thing that I found myself critiquing in the back of my head certain particular political candidates, right? I'm like, I don't want to do that because I, I, I don't think that that's true. It's not... That's not me showing up and that's not me uh, really giving you anything about where I'm coming from. That's me just, me just kind of waxing poetic on uh, sort of the, uh, the psalms of our civic religion. I can do a whole lot for you guys around some language around our constitution and our declaration of independence being the uh, sort of the political junkie, history buff kind of guy that I am. I really can do some neat rhetorical flourishes around a more perfect union and what it means to uh, actively move in the direction of perfecting that union, understanding perfect as not just a noun but as a verb. Um, I had some good stuff uh, loaded up for you guys, but then I was like, you know what, I'm just going to, I'm just going to give something a little more, I'm going to try to be a little more humble and, and, and be a little more direct. But there was something that I absolutely have to share uh, from, uh, from a podcast um, on being with Krista Tippett. Uh, she had one of those candidates on. Uh, that I'm kind of criticizing in, in the back of my head. Um, in, in their book, uh, she, she told me, she said, uh, you said, from, uh, for Virginia Jones, hope was relational. It didn't exist in the abstract. Hope confronts. It does not ignore pain, agony, or injustice. It is not a saccharine optimism that refuses to see, face, or grapple with the wretchedness of reality. You can't have active hope without despair because hope is a response. Hope is the act of conviction that despair will never have the last word. Hope is the act of conviction that despair will never um, have the last word. And I, I wanted to do kind of a, a sort of a whole talk that was inspired on that. And I found myself ironically mired in my own despair. Um, and I found myself uh, wrestling with uh, I got a couple of friends that I just found out are homeless. <coughs> uh, back in East Tennessee, where I'm from. And uh, one of them is very well educated, has a master's degree and is having a difficult time finding a, 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 a means of employ. And he's, um, he's a very skilled therapist. Um, I actually had him walk me through how he does a session uh, once, just because uh, a dear friend of mine, so he's actually the father of a dear friend of mine um, who committed suicide. And you talk about shame. 
the kind of shame that he shared with me that he feels around being a therapist and his son committed suicide. But his, his son, before he died, uh, asked me to talk to him about his work. And so I did that. And he said, well, let me just show you what I do. And he walked me through it. He's, he is incredibly skilled at what he does and how efficient he is and how well he knows his craft. Um, he is a black belt in Kung Fu. I mean, he is just such an incredible person. He is a, he is a wonderful artist. I mean, uh, he, he, he paints portraits better than what I saw at the Frist this, week, this weekend, uh, or, or certainly at least just as good. I mean, it's incredible. Um, and he found himself homeless and mired by kind of a lot of those same causes um, that I was talking about, where we have to recognize that we have 140 million of our fellow Americans in poverty. We've got like some 330 million people, let me put that in perspective for you, some 330 million people in this country that make up this country. We have 140 million in poverty. I think it's something like 40% or more of, of Americans uh, don't have four or five hundred dollars in their savings account. Which means, what does that mean? Let me unpack that for you. It means that somebody with a surprise diagnosis, like what I was talking about, it means they're going to go bankrupt like that, mm -hmm. overnight. It means that an accident, a car accident that injures you, which happened to another friend of mine, could cause you to go bankrupt overnight. Seemingly for no reason. And we have a society that is, is sort of built on scarcity. We have an economic system that operates on the assumption that the basic problem is scarcity. And I have to go back to, I mentioned in my last talk and in my talk back, I mentioned that conservative economic historian Neil Ferguson. He talked about the five ingredients for a populist backlash. And I was spending a lot of time thinking about that. And his own prescription, a conservative himself said that, he said, I've just got to say it, we've got to elect. You guys are going to have to, he's, he's a Briton. He said, you're, you're going to have to elect a progressive. And what does he mean by progressive? We all kind of know vaguely what that means. But essentially he said, you're going to have to find someone who's actually going to uh, seek to make changes um, in, um, in our economic systems, uh, in our laws that are going to actually be corrective in ways that aren't you know, uh, kind of consistent with his own ideology. So even he was saying that. He said that he learned that um, that politicians, that presidents, that prime ministers in particular are going to have to start relying less on um, economic models and more on economic history. And so I started asking myself, what the heck is he talking about? What could that mean? What does that look like? And I thought, I thought about the, my own experiences in my economic classes where I would raise my hand and I would ask a question about the funder, their fundamental underlying assumptions going on with the models, right? And I'd ask questions about ways the models don't hold up, ways that they run counter to our experience based on economic history. Um, what I got was a particular brand kind of an ideology that was sort of being pushed, which is actually uh, the Austrian School of Economics. And I was talked to like I didn't know what the hell I was talking about. And there's been a lot of experiences in my life where I've had that, where I've raised kinds of questions and I'm, I'm spoken to as if I don't know what the heck I'm talking about. And so I asked these questions about the problems, uh, some of the problems in the models, and I posed some counter examples. Um, and eventually I lost interest in my economics classes because I was coming from that sort of singular perspective. Um, but the kind of things that he, the, the kind of things that seem to me that he's talking about, there is, I, very funny enough, there is a, there's a school of thought now that I want to share with you guys, talk about hope. I just want to give a little bit of, tease you with a little bit of good news and some of the, some of the positive nuggets that I found that really make me think we might be on the brink of some innovations. We might potentially have a chance to uh, have some particular innovations where we can move the needle in a positive direction. Um, one of those is there's sort of a new school tradition um, in, in economics that agrees with Neil Ferguson uh, and then 
based on economic history and um, and just kind of looking at success of various nations relies on kind of a Hamiltonian um, perspective where we have found what they're calling the new consensus where they have a number of folks who are very much Wall Street Journal type folks if you know what I mean Financial Times readers right uh, very much Wall Street insiders uh, including the former president of the World Bank uh, has come around to see, wrote a book saying there were a number of assumptions we came into the crash with that we learned just didn't work. Uh, here's what we've learned. And this new consensus uh, is bringing together uh, these Wall Street types and it's bringing together democratic socialists. So we've got folks from left, far left and far right kind of coming together around a few basic uh, ideas. And I want to encourage you to check out the new consensus. There are a number of uh, books available to read if you really want to dig deep. Um, some of the basic ideas in sort of kind of a Hamiltonian plan actually evolved, to borrow from the right, a little bit of protectionism, ironically, which is a little surprising to me. But protectionism of what? Of what industries? Industries that a, a nation selects and that they, that they really want to double down on, that they think that they can really specialize in. If you're not thinking about Japan right now, you should be. Um, because they've weathered globalization probably are arguably about the best of any other nation. Um, and one of the industries that the United States, they argue, could specialize in is around uh, green energy uh, infrastructure. Um, they also speak about fiat money, uh, printing money uh, to purchase these developments and infrastructure. And their notion is if you make an investment where you get a return of three dollars or so per dollar, that probably makes a lot more sense than passing it off in a tax cut where you don't get any kind of return. Um, so that's one thing that I'll, I want you guys to take a look at. Um, and to close with uh, kind of a some of those rhetorical flourishes, if you will, um, I want to go back and kind of reclaim uh, three core ideas real quick in a UU way. Um, and I want to talk about faith, hope, and love, and I can do it kind of quick. Um, where's my book here? I want to share with you guys, I want to recommend this book called The Logic of Faith. Kind of a problematic title for some <laughs> folks, maybe, perhaps. Um, uh, but in this community, this may be well received. It's, the subtitle is important. A Buddhist Approach to Finding Certainty Beyond Belief and Doubt. Um, and the author unpacks a notion uh, uh, the English translation is uh, dependent arising where everything arises, plays out, and falls away in reliance upon an infinite web of contingent relationships, i.e. our first principle. Um, uh, for hope, I want you to ascribe, I want to encourage you to ascribe to an active hope that seeks to understand where you are, what your unique passion, talent, uh, and strength is where that intersects with a need in the world and in your community and in Unitarian Universalism. And then for love, I want to challenge you to embody that uh, Kingian conception of love uh, that I spoke to earlier, uh, that isn't anemic, uh, that isn't just about feeling, uh, but it is about pursuing uh, justice and taking corrective action uh, for some of the kinds of causes um, of this sense of scarcity that we're dealing with that I spoke to earlier. And I think I'll just leave it at that. Thank you.